Lord, we are grateful for such a session tonight when we can gather to listen and even to hear from your servants whom you have used and worked with in ways that are practical. We are grateful, our Father, tonight that as we link up in this meeting, Lord, we are going to minister to our lives. Thank you for each one of us. We pray for this session. We pray, Lord, that the heavens will be open for us. We pray that every one of us, our Lord, at the end of this session, will have a reason to be grateful that we were part of it. Thank you for everyone, the facilitator and uh, his team, and even all of us that are uh, linked to this meeting tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Paul. We now hand over meeting to our brother Hudson. He will be our moderator this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to welcome all of us this evening for a very, very special meeting that we have tonight. Um, we trust the Lord that he's going to speak to us. Maybe for Jimmy and uh, Dr. Mboweni, I'd like to introduce SALT. SALT is um, an acronym just like SALT, the one we put in our food, uh, which for us means Sondulas Africa Leadership Training. It's a program we run uh, under the Intercessors for Africa. So we run it in nations, in Kenya, in Uganda, in Nigeria, and Ghana. And Sondulas is a Greek word that means servants of the same Lord. It's about servant leadership. And we have been running in Kenya from 2008. We had done something in 99, but formally we began it as a training, a 22 week training that um, we talk about servant leadership, practical issues of transforming our nation, our communities. And so in the course of the time, students have done projects, written proposals, and some of them have really gone far in our setup of government to county governments, made proposals that have been picked up. And so we are very, very grateful for you joining us. And of course, uh, in the period we are in, it's, the pandemic has thrown us into a new space. We used to do this in uh, a classroom where people register, pay and come to class in Nairobi and in one of our towns in Eldoret. And so we've been toying, trying to go to other uh, regions of our country, but it has not been able because you need a secretariat, you need facilitators. But when COVID came, it has even, apart from pushing us back, it has actually made us leap forward in terms of getting one class done for the whole nation. And now we can run the class and people from across the country and beyond can even attend. And so it's really a great pleasure to have you join us and be with us for this training. So we are on our second day of training of this class and we thought that your experience and testimony would stir us up as we think about the projects we need to do, as we think about the depth we need to go in thinking about our communities because it's about servant leadership by example. And, um, that is a great, great opportunity for us. And therefore, it's a bigger platform, it's a greater way of reaching people that COVID has brought us. And so we thought we can take it up. And uh, we have done some also, apart from that, we do public lectures, which we have done, uh, two of them before we started this class. And we just try to mobilize believers in society and beyond. And so we have had people even from government or county governments, judges, lecturers attend this and it has been a great, great blessing. And so we are so privileged to have you come. And so for our participants tonight, um, we have uh, Dr. Jimmy Shindi and Dr. Mboweni and his wife, Saru, who are going to be speaking to us tonight. We just want to welcome them from Econet, but more so these are great, great friends. 
that we have had a long journey with that introducing them out waste a lot of class time <laughs> just to strand narrate the journeys we have had a walk with each one of them uh, jimmy has been in kenya lived here for some years dr mboweni and his wife have been great friends we have stayed at their house we have eaten their food and i don't know what else and so we are very grateful for your acceptance to be with us tonight and to speak to us friends these are great friends who not only speak principles but they practice them and that is the reason why i invited them to come and speak to us so before dr mboweni and saru jimmy please you're welcome would you say something for, to our participants and just introduce yourself to us even though i've introduced you but i may not have introduced you well because we know each other too much <laughs> thank you jimmy Shin, you're welcome thank you very much uh, brother hudson um thank you for 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 that introduction uh, i don't have much to say tonight um I, i'm also going to be you know listening to dr mboweni and uh, mrs uh, mboweni but i'm i'm happy to be part of um this uh, you know discussion we are very excited about taking the word of god to uh, our communities and transform we believe that um, you know our community is actually waiting for us to bring the principles that we are learning from the word of god and uh, you know transform our communities in ways that they will see god you know at, at, at work so um you know I, I really am excited and, and i'm inspired by the the testimony that i know uh, dr mboweni and mrs mboweni are going to share with you because it's a um, you know really testimony to uh, the transformation capacity that the word of god has so i will leave it here uh, and uh, take it back to you thank you thank you very much um, dr shindi our participants uh, dr mboweni you are so welcome we are so grateful for you and please participants we were to visit the joseph village this year COVID has denied us, but maybe God wants a, be a bigger constituency. So I'm sure after now, I'll wow. be bringing a delegation to Joseph Village from Kenya. <laughs> Because I'm sure after this testimony, many people would want to come and vi visit the Joseph Village. So please, wow. Dr. and Mrs. Mboweni, you're welcome to share with us this testimony, this great thing that God is doing. The floor is yours. Thank you. You're welcome. We are listening. God bless you. Thank you very much. Uh, allow me just to say, um, just for this privilege to share on this platform, we want to thank God. And we thank you, my brother and my sister. You, you are um, amazing people for us. Uh, you are a tremendous encouragement. And uh, we don't take this invitation lightly. So all glory and honor be to the Lord. I would want my beautiful wife here to say something, then we can basically go into it. <laughs> uh, greetings to everyone. It's lovely to be here, like Doug has said, and, said, and I think I will just pray mm. and just commit thank everything you, to the Lord. Yes, Lord. Let's pray. Father, I want to just thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Yes, so much. I thank you, Lord, that you, you are God who knows us, Lord, in every way. And you are God who always goes ahead of us. Lord, I want to commit this session for your throne of grace. And I want to say, reign King Jesus, reign. Yes, so It's much. all about you, my dear Heavenly Father. And I pray that, Lord, you take complete charge, complete authority over what is going to be taking place tonight. Mm -hmm. Lord, may you be magnified even through the presentation. May it be truly all about you. And whatever is not of my God, I pray that you may just flush it out. Thank you, Jesus. And only your word, and only that which you have purposed, my God, should come forth and touch lives. And I know, Father, that where you have touched will never be the same again. So I commit this time into your precious hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Right. So what, what we will do is basically just um, run through a PowerPoint presentation we have prepared to structure our testimony. Uh, this is the testimony about Joseph Village. And uh, Saruzai is, uh, is a visionary in that village. She trains people in that village. So really, God has given me a tremendous companion who um, compliments me in ways that I cannot easily describe. So I, I just want to thank the Lord. So what we will do is she has allowed me to be the lead speaker 
um, but she will be coming in here and there. Uh, the, the presentation is basically our, the, we, we work together, um, but she has appointed me and I have not refused to have the <laughs> delegate to me uh, the, the task. So I will share my screen now, um, basically so that we can begin to look at the beginning, uh, how, where it all started. And, 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 and then I, I will run through the, um, the key elements of this presentation. But what, where, where I wanted to start off from is this issue of dependence. So we are moving from dependence. The picture you are seeing there is a very familiar picture within the rural areas in Zimbabwe, where people are basically being given handouts, uh, soap, cooking oil, beans, and you name it. And if you look at where these people are sitting, it's a very precious ground, but there's nothing going on there. And this was basically what we were seeing in Joseph village. And we were very unhappy with this very picture. And we kept on asking God, God, you gave us the capacity to produce. You gave us the capacity to take dominionship. Like he says in Genesis chapter one, verse 28. Why are we like this? Why? That has been the question. And, and, and I thank God that the transformation we are seeing from dependence to productivity is something that is really encouraging us. Those pictures that you see are Joseph village pictures where we are having young men, young women, basically working and tilling that ground which used to be completely dry and nothing coming out. And we are seeing productivity coming out of the ground. And of course, the word of God says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 23, in all labor, there is profit, but I do not lead to, to poverty. And so we're saying, God, you have promised us that all labor, not some, but all labor, there is profit, but I do not lead to poverty. And so I, I was saying to Saruzai, let's take God on his word and they say, God, you gave us Joseph Village for a purpose, and we believe that we are going to be productive, we are going to have profit coming out of the land. And for sure, God watches his word to perform it. He will keep his word, his word will always stand. And this is the testimony of our village. So what I would like to do uh, with Saruzai coming in here and there is to go through five areas. We are going to talk briefly about the background of Joseph Village. Then we are going to talk about the germination of a village vision, how the vision germinated. We will move on through to village, the village spiritual breakthrough um, because it's very important. And then we are going to look at the journey where from when we had our village breakthrough, we are going to talk about the blossoming and productivity that we are seeing now in the village. And then we conclude by looking at the future of the village as we talk right now. So moving on to the background of the village, I want to start off with Acts chapter 26, verse 28, uh, 26 to 28, says up to Acts 17, 26 to 28. And the word says, from one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and their boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him, we live, we move, and have our being. My brothers and sisters, we were very energized by this scripture. And so we knew that though I was born in Joseph village, which people kind of look down upon, God did a special purpose for it. Because like he says in verse 26, he marked it out and appointed time in history and boundaries of this land, and he put me in there. So I'm not by accident a Joseph village citizen. And then, but verse 27 says, God did this so that I would seek him, reach out for him, and find him and begin to know that in him I live, I move, and have my being. 
So as a family with Sarudai, we have now agreed that we are in Joseph Village by God's appointment, not by accident. So we shouldn't run away from it. Instead, we should ask God, God, what is it that you have packaged in the village? You will notice that the village is between a mountain or a hill, which we call Majo Hill, and a river, which we call Runde River. You will see the importance of this as we go along. But the, the village is about 437 from Marare, located, it's called Menezi, under Chief Negari. The village has got 44 households uh, with 330 people in an area of about 25 square kilometers. Now, the background to this village is that it is a dry piece of land, but I want to share some specific statistics. The Zimbabwean population density is about 38 people per square kilometer. Harare, where we are right now, is 1,700 1, people per square kilometer. But when you look at Joseph Village, the population density is 12 people per square kilometer. So you have got plenty of space, plenty of fresh air, no pollution because there are no industries that are causing all kinds of pollution. So that's why you find the sky when it's blue, it's blue, really blue, very nice. Sometimes we fail to see this beauty because we have got the world's perception of what development is or, or what life is. And so you notice that when I took some demographics of this village, out of the 318 people, 35% are below 19, 20% between the age of 30 to 39. So essentially, you will notice that those people who are 39 years and below, they constitute 65% of this village. Then you have got 40 to 64, 30%, and over 65 years, 15%. But it's a village where most people run away from, they go to South Africa, they go to the cities, and so the place has basically been empty. No activity has been going on. Now, what are the typical villages or the household? This is the kind of typical household you will see. Um, so, Generally, people have moved from the issue of Paul and Daga. Now they've actually started molding bricks, um, but it's basically basic accommodation that they put up for themselves. Um, then, of course, those who are kind of advanced, they will put window panes and things like that. But generally, you have got these round structures. And then you have got also some fairly advanced people who will now put zinc. Uh, they will buy cement and they'll put a fairly nice structures that you will see. Now, we made a decision, myself and Salzai, that we were going not to accept the status quo. So this place that you see is where my dad uh, built his home. My dad is left, but my mother is still alive. And so we decided to go and put and put a building at my father's house. So the red, the red roof structure that you see here is um, Sarudzai and Douglas' house. And then we also built our mother a, a fairly uh, um, a modern house here. And my father had built his house there. And that's where, that's the, that's the original house that my mother would use with my dad. But we basically went in and then upgraded the household and put new structures in there, put water tanks. Because you see, what used to happen is that when we went to the village, it was hit and run because it was not as comfortable as we want. So we would drive there, literally just say, hi, hi, how are you? And then vanish. And we said, no, we are not doing that. Let us go and make sure that when we are home, we can stay for a week and we can actually enjoy being there. So my wife, Every year, she would take the children uh, during the month of June, June and, June and July, and they would go and stay just as if they are in Harare. And the children actually miss going Kumusha. And even because of COVID, we have not been traveling that much, and they've always been missing going to the, to the rural household. So that's a closer look at the house. We did not want to 
uh, create a temporary structure or something that will say, uh, we really said, let's make it very comfortable. And so we'll show you in the inside, we actually equipped it with um, uh, nice seats so that we can sit, we can chat, we, we can have visitors come and we can really talk without missing the city. Um, the, Saru Zai loves to cook. So we made sure that there is enough cooking equipment. She can actually do a cooking using gas and so forth. And this is in the village. Now, the, the, the issue is this, many people we build structures in the cities, uh, but when we go to the villages, it's like, no, this is not a place to be. And so we don't want to invest in the villages. We, we, we shifted that mindset. And so around the household, we actually also put some activities so that when we are there, we are working in the garden and we are part of the ground, the soil, and we work it and make sure that we can see its productivity. So these are some of the vegetables that we have been working on around the household. And we also capture as much water with rains. We make sure that we have been enough tanks to capture the water. And we use that water very uh, wisely to make sure that we have got something that is thriving. Now, what are the, so when you look at this ground piece of land, the question that arises is, what is it that is in this village that we believe is key? It's the land is the water. I know that this, is, uh, this land is part of the driest part of Zimbabwe, but we've got the river. Remember Runde River, which I showed you. Runde River is one of the big, I mean, it's a fairly big river. It has been affected by siltation, but when you dig at the base of the river, you always find water. So we believe that water is one of the assets that God has given the village. And of course, the sun, which is useful for photosynthesis. So what we've done, my brothers and sisters, is that we then started asking ourselves, what can we do in this village? And I would like Saru to comment on the germination of the village vision. And you can see in the picture there, there is Saru training the women. And when we were working with the women, something then ignited because these people are very keen to learn. They are desirous of knowledge. And so what we did is, we went back to the village and a vision was born. How was it born? All the four boys in my father's household were allocated pieces of land from our father's estate. So I got a piece of land and my wife and children were already like mentioned going into the village, doing some work there during June of every year. And then when the land was allocated in 2017, my wife initiated work to make the land productive that we were given as a showcase for the other villagers to follow. And so since that time, we have extended training to other villagers on agriculture as well as women on patchwork. And my brothers and sisters, this was the birth of a vision to set the whole village on a productivity mindset and depart from the dependence syndrome. But I just wanted to start just to, I know I've, I've talked all the key elements, but just to echo the, the points, and maybe there's something that I've left out. I think basically you've covered it all. Uh, each time we went there with the children, you know, on the June, June holiday, we always asked ourselves, uh, oh, you, we only learned what we do in the one week or two weeks or whatever duration of time we're going to be there. And so the children decided to invest their time in the local primary school where Doug went uh, for his primary education. So they would go teach, uh, you know, uh, work with uh, teachers there and uh, help out in the learning process. In the meantime, I'm left home with my, initially in the first few years, I would go with them because I was helping with trying to do some learning at the school and also to develop a library. When I felt that was taking, taking off, I then decided I was going to spend more time, uh, you know, in the village with my mother-in-law and the other elderly women and women of all ages who had nothing to do. So I then, uh, started patchwork. I'm a member of the Arare Patchwork Guild, mm -hmm. and I learned a lot of valuable uh, sewing skills, which I thought, you know, I could transfer to the ladies in the rural areas. Initially, it looked like a very difficult task, 
And I was wondering if they were going to even understand, you know, if you saw on that picture, we have all age groups, yeah, we'll you know, uh, yes, who were coming along and eager to learn. And each time I saw them sitting in the church, we, we would meet at the One Way Ministries Church there, the hunger for knowledge, the desire to do things was just overwhelming. That's and right. uh, I've never looked back. I think each time I felt like, oh, you know, I'm tired. And then, you know, I looked through those pictures there were just enough motivation for me to look at step number two. You get them assignments, they would work through the night. And the next day, they can't wait until they show you what they've done. That's so it right. has been quite an inspirational journey. Yes. And, and then, so what we started to do is, we, that was the piece of land that was allocated to us uh, in the village. So we then had the fields and the paddocks. We marked them out clearly, and then we, we used the one-way ministries. So there's one-way ministries in the village and they are closer to the river. So they started actually getting water from the river through to the church. And we put, we put piping uh, through to the fields. Is about 1.2 kilometers. So 1,200 meters. So it's fairly close to the river and it made life easy to put the piping to drive the water. And then we have actually since put another line directly to the fields because there's now increased the demand for water. And so we actually put another line. And so we found that the river became a life source because of the water coming from the river. And we are going to talk more about that. Now, we then also installed solar panels which are now instrumental in terms of driving the water into the, to the fields. Remember, I talked about the sun. So we are now using the water from Runde River, the sun, which is free from God, and the land. So the marriage of the sun, the land, and the moon, as well the, and, the, and the, the land, the land, the sun, and the water is basically now creating that ecosystem, which is enabling us to be very productive in the village, the sun for photosynthesis, and of course for driving the uh, the water into the rivers. So that is the piece of land that I was allocated by my 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 my, my mother and uh, my brothers were also given their pieces of land. And so what we are doing is now we actually partitioned them very systematically to create um, to create a, a, a very um, structured way of looking at the land. So this is not an afterthought, well carefully thought out. So we started actually mapping out. I sat down with Saru Zaya and we agreed, field one, field two, field three. We know the capacities. We know the demands of water by each of these fields. So we basically said, Saru, let's give it our excellent approach. And that is what we did. And then from there, Saru continued to train the, 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 the women. And so you will see they're doing patchwork there. And all these women are very keen. In fact, we are going to see them uh, on Saturday, the day after tomorrow, God willing, we are going back to the village. And again, we are going to meet with them. They are going to showcase what they've been doing with their hands. And, 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 and they are very keen. In fact, some of the product they produce here can match anyone in the world. I mean, the, the skills are absolutely amazing. And all they need is somebody to train them, to show them how to do things, and they are very willing to learn. So the village is full of people who are desiring to learn. So we then even sent experts. So the guy you see uh, standing there in a sun hat is actually a, an, what, agronomist? an agronomist from Arari. And so we sent him to the village and he started actually showing the villagers how to put seed, how to use even drip irrigation, basic, basic skills, very important. And so, and, 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 the, and, the, and the, the cost that we incur doing this is fractional compared to what you do in the cities. And then of course, uh, the men, you, you know, interestingly, the women are very quick at catching the vision. And then you find that once the women have caught the vision, they go and tell the, 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 the men of the house and the men also come out and they uh, pick lessons. So it's very key to realize that training is actually fundamental. Now, I want to talk about a very important point. 
And this is spiritual breakthrough. Our villages are usually under siege. But 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, will humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I heal their land. And so I knew with Sarudai, but you know, there are so many things happening in the village, so many practices that are in abomination before the Lord. So we joined the hands and asked our pastor, Pastor Gatsi, to help us bring the village to repentance. And I am humbled by what happened last year in 2019 on the 3rd of May. We went to the village with Pastor Gatsi and we went up the mountain um, where we prayed and blew the shofar and declared Jesus Christ is Lord over Joseph village. And we declared and we sang, blew the shofars. And I believe that was a serious breakthrough that the village got. Now I'm going to play this video. I know that normally when I play, play it on this platform, it doesn't come out well, but the essence of it is what we did on that mountain. So I hope you will be able to catch the glimpse of it. So I'll, I'll stop presenting, I'll, I'll stop talking now and you can see whether it watches, it will play well. And then we pick it up from there. So my brothers and sisters, the point here is that we went to the peak of the mountain in this village and we declared the sovereignty of God, the supremeness of God over the entire village. We asked for forgiveness on behalf of the land, on behalf of the villages, for every abomination that had happened on this mountain or in the village, which was an offense to the Lord. We said, Lord, forgive us. In fact, while we were coming down this mountain, we actually went to a place where there were lots of pots. And these were pots which were used for rituals and so forth. And some of them were actually current pots and we broke them. We had no mercy whatsoever. We were not apologetic. We broke all of them. We say, it, is, it has no place in this village. This village belongs to God. And I believe that this is absolutely fundamental for freeing the village so that it can become productive. Because lack of productivity is a siege from the enemy. And so within the next day, on the 4th of May, we gathered at the One Way Ministries, the villagers came together and we went through confession and declaring and many actually received the Lord Jesus Christ in this session. I will not play the whole of it, uh, because some, uh, the volume might actually not be that much. But basically, what we did is Pastor Gatsilen led us to confession, and villagers were very forthcoming, raising their hands, and indeed saying, Lord, forgive us for this abomination that has been happening in here. I want to be free. I want to move on with my life. And it was on this particular day that the villagers actually declared that, in fact, Pastor Gaz then ended by saying, I'm taking the keys of David and now I, I'm un unlocking the village. That was last year in May. My brothers and sisters, what has happened from that day is a miracle. And we are continuing to see miracles. 
these pictures that you are seeing here, these are Joseph's village pictures right now. And the word of God says in Psalm 67, verse 6 to 7, then the earth shall yield the increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. And we are seeing this happening in Joseph Village, my brothers and sisters. In my mother, in fact, I want my wife to say exactly what my mother said. Uh, because she has, I mean, since she got married, the land, she, this land used to be part of her land, but she actually verbalized something with her own mouth. And maybe you want to share that. Mm. When we started farming, we had to, because this is uh, uh, sandy soils, you know that, uh, not the river sand, but the pit sand yeah, kind of, soils, yeah. the, mm. the, you know, uh, kind of soils. And uh, my mother-in-law, when we started, we looked for ant hills, we looked for uh, compost, we looked for cow dung, and you know, so that we could improve the, the quality and the texture of the soil. And so she came and found, I had given the workers some instructions on how to prepare scooping out, you know, uh, in these trenches that uh, pit sand yes. so that we could replace it or mix it up with the uh, anteal soil that we had uh, gotten, uh, the compost and all. And she got there and she was quite actually infuriated because she was saying, so many years ago, even when I got married, I don't remember if, right. ever seeing a, you know, working in those fields. But she said, you know, I put in 13, um, Will, what, uh, what do you call, scotch cuts. scotch cuts of manure into these fields. And you are taking away all those uh, 13, you know, uh, scotch cut uh, uh, amounts of, uh, of uh, compost. And I said, mom, how many years ago? I had it by that time, I mean, even my daughter, I don't think was born. And oh, but she still believed those 13 scotch cuts of manure were still valid. And so she waited, she was like, I had a wait and see, this is their testimony. So she was waiting to see what this kind of new agriculture was going to turn out like. So she let it go. She's talking now, by the way, after almost two years, where, you know, uh, since we started the project, she now came one day and said, when I was there last with the children over the holidays, she said, you know, now I need to testify. I actually thought you guys were wasting time and all, but actually I was very wrong. She has started implementing some of the methods that she has seen our workers, you know, uh, using on their farming, uh, in, on, the, on our plot, you know, in their own small garden that we have left here with. That's so right. it is amazing. So I think when God says the earth shall yield the increase, God, our own God shall bless us. God shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. We are now seeing a lot of people coming to the village from the cities, wanting to come and see what's happening. And I believe that God has caused something to move in the village. So what exactly is happening? So Joseph village, like I said, there is the land, the water and the soil. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 12 says, the Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens to give you rain to your land in its season, to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. But of course, as you know, Deuteronomy 8, 28 comes with the issue of obedience, obeying him. So this is one message we've taken to the village. Guys, we must look up to the Lord, obey him, and our land will receive the blessing that he has promised us. And this is what we are seeing, my brothers and my sisters. The issue of the land, the water, and the sun, which are assets given by God. What we did then is we actually then started putting crops. But with the crops, we knew that we needed the, we needed the water, particularly during the dry season. So we have actually put the solar panels, which they draw water from the river pump the water into the, in, into the tanks. And then during the dry patch of the year, we then actually irrigate the crops. And I, my brothers and sisters, this is the testimony of Joseph Village. Productivity through God given and the free sun, water, and land. 
and productivity is moving in an unprecedented way. These are some of the solar panels that we, 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 we implemented. And by the way, the, all the metal work was done by the villagers. This is work that it was actually done from one of the growth points. There's a guy who used to do very basic welding kind of jobs. We asked him to come and do this work and he came and did this work. And so the solar panels, they track the sun. So you can tilt them and you can switch. You can actually change their direction if you want, uh, change the angles, and he did that. And so from the river, which gets fairly dry, this is part, 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 in terms of the year, this is the driest part of the year. But then, like I told you, if you dig at the base of the river, you always find water. So what we did is we put panels close to the river, then put pipes, into the pools that we would dig at the river base and started driving water from these kind of pools in the river, on the riverbed during the dry months. And so we are now starting to pump water from these pools onto tanks that are at the land, um, the, 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 where, where the land is. So we found a high point and using those solar pumps, uh, like for example, right now you've got three horsepower solar pumps, which you can actually find in um, very easily. And so we implemented them. And so they, during the day, they are pumping water into these tanks. During the night, the guys then actually irrigate the vegetables. Why we prefer the night is because then the evaporation is at its lowest, the water goes into the ground, and then you mulch your vegetables so that when day comes and the heat is there, then you, it, it, you minimize the loss of water. And so th th this has been very eye-opening in terms of how we conserve water. So we've got a, a, a 40,000 uh, water tank, which we construct, this is a concrete tank. So we pump it and we, we, we pump the water in there. And then during the night again, we basically irrigate the land. And now we did this so that it, it can also be a showcase to the nearby villagers that these things can be done. And it doesn't necessarily require lots of money because for example this tank was constructed by the local vi the villagers finding the materials locally uh, yes you need to buy the cement but basically you can get the labor and some of the materials in within the village so we then actually went out and found some drip pipes because we cannot waste water and so we started actually laying these pipes and making sure that water goes only to the point where the vegetable is. And so you minimize the uh, wastage of water. And so what we saw is that now slowly, we began to actually plant these um, crops. And like Saru was saying, we would of course prepare the ground and make sure that the ground is fertile enough um, and then make sure that the vegetables draw water only as and when is necessary. And so this is what we started doing. And what we then also decided to do is that initially the seedlings were coming from Arare. And we told the guys that, no, 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 you do your own seedlings. So for example, what you are seeing there, these are actually seedlings that are being done in Joseph village. This is rape, right? Yeah. This is rape, which is and fine. Cool. And cover, which is done in the Joseph village. Then we've got tomatoes. They've actually now become experts in actually doing these nurseries. And you see, this whole idea of teaching them is very important. And what we are also now seeing is that other villages are now coming to actually buy seedlings from Joseph Village. And so all of a sudden, the young people who are doing this are very excited because they can now convert their skills into initiatives that can actually generate value for the village. And so they then, uh, started actually growing. Uh, the, the, uh, this is one of the tomato crop that they were growing. And if you look at the poles that they are using there, this is for trellising. And I think Saru, you can explain, explain the, the trellising. Um, because um, you need to support the plants. And so they would go to the nearby uh, resett resettlement, resettlement farm, farms, and they would get the poles uh, from there. And then they would put in these fields so that the tomato crop is well supported. And I must say, even through winter, 
normally winter is tough for the tomatoes, but they actually found ways of uh, protecting the tomatoes from harsh, cold weather. And so in the night, they would do, what do you call it? Okay. Uh, those uh, heaters, you know, the African heaters, the, yeah, the, the, where you actually have the drum and you, you know, use an X to create holes all around. And then you put your firewood inside. And then uh, when, the, you know, the, when it has stopped, uh, the charcoal. The, when, the, yeah, the, when the charcoal remains, yeah. after it has bent through, then you can put them, you know, stop. Throughout around, you know, the field. And, and it literally, you then control the temperature yeah. of that environment so that if, if there is frost and things like that, your crop is protected. This is actually a winter crop. That's correct. This yeah. was June, oh, July, yes. yeah. this crop here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and the villagers are actually very excited to know that they can actually control, they can do a micro a control of the, of the climate and prevent frost and things like that. And they are learning every day and they are doing these initiatives in an amazing way. So that was the tomato crop. And then of course the maize, I mean, this is amazing. My mother was astounded. She had never seen maize uh, in, uh, in winter. Um, so we have got the winter maize. Um, in fact, Saru was showing me some of the pictures. It's going to be ready when? I think end, end of this month. End of this month. And by the way, when it's ready, there are already orders People are saying, when this crop is ripe, I'm making my order straight away. So by the time they actually, uh, the, the, the crop is ready, it has got takers already. Um, this, it, basically because they've never seen anything like this. Now, our message has been to say, it mustn't just be one point. We actually want one village after the other to catch this vision so that it does not just supply the local environment but we can even consider export to other cities and other places. And I'll talk about that later. So we are seeing the village, uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, blossoming and producing things that it had never produced. When I talk about cabbages, well, these crops, my brothers and sisters, they had never seen a cabbage crop in Joseph village. We used to import it maybe I mean, from close to Arari because they never believed that you could have cabbages growing in Joseph village. But this is Joseph village product as we speak. And so what we have also done is we have also put some sheds because in September and October, it gets very hot. So you need to protect the crop from the harsh uh, sun rays. And so there is this uh, net which we put on top of the crops, um, which filters 40% of the sunlight so that when it then hits the crop, it's more friendly. So that is the crop looking at it from a distance. Um, and, 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 and you can actually see the environment, the surrounding is quite dry. If you look at the mount, the hill there, uh, it's quite dry, but we are managing to get the land to produce, which is in line with what God said, he will command the land to yield its strength. Now, this is a, a crop, uh, this was actually from last year's last crop, year's the, tom uh, the, the onion, a beautiful onion that came out from this village. And I must say that um, it had, it had uh, customers as far as, as Blue Ale, uh, right? And this year, um, one of the Indian businessmen in one of the second largest cities of Ferrari, uh, he wanted how many tons again? Was it, was it? He wanted actually more than we had. Yeah. He wanted about uh, 20, 30 tons. They, they are talking about 20 tons, 30 tons, 50 tons. So the message to the villagers was, guys, you need now to join hands. One household after the other, all the 44 households in Joseph village, the, village, the vision we have is that each one should be doing their own piece so that when there is an order, we put our order together and then we can send it to the customer. When then there is a payment, we then distribute the amounts, uh, the revenue that is coming out in proportion to what people have, co have contributed. So these are some of the things that we have been doing in the village and really just continuing to um, uh, drive productivity within the village. Uh, and, and so, and so these are some of the people who are working, villagers who have come there. So it has also created employment. Um, and in fact, the lady in the picture there, there is a story. Remember the, 
the husband was working in South Africa and the father-in-law of this lady actually said in the entire history of this guy's marriage, they had not received um, pocket money or what have you from either the husband, from the husband, of course, because he was the one working. But this lady, when she, when she was now working and she's getting um, her wages from the land, she used her first salary to go and give the father-in-law and he was really touched. He was almost in tears. And he, he testified to, to, uh, to my mother actually that it had never happened. So it is transforming people's lives. It is transforming the way things are looked at in the village. Moving on, so, so you can see again, this is basically em employment creation uh, within the village, something that never used to happen. Uh, people never used to believe that you can make a living out of the land. Now, this is something that, uh, again, I think Saru, you need to explain this one. The manure, you know, you, you, the mountains and the hills have plenty of these leaves that fall every winter. And we have now said, let's collect it. But Saru, explain that one because that's your baby. Okay. Yeah. We actually uh, we have taught them how to make their own compost because the soil is quite, uh, the land is quite tired, it's sandy soils. And uh, I remember uh, my team here in Arare, uh, we, we, I took them to Foundations for Farming uh, with Brian Audrey. Uh, and they were taught, the 12 of them went for a whole day to be taught on compost making. So then I, when we started Joseph Village Farming, I then, then said, uh, sent one of the guys to Joseph Village to train them on compost making. So when we got there, we realized, you know, under the trees, in the mountains, all around the forest, there was a lot of dead material, which mm -hmm. was very, uh, very well decomposed. So we then told the villagers, if they needed, uh, because people used to come and ask for money, ask for this and that, we said, we're not going to give handouts. So we said there will be a job for each and everyone who is willing to work. So we told them our dream to make compost. So those who could go and find these uh, dead leaves and uh, put them by the roadside where our eight ton truck can reach, you know, then we, we do reconciliations and pay them. And uh, so we started having villagers going from all over, you know, and then they'll bring their hips closer to the road from mountain tops to whatever. And it was amazing how much compost we managed to uh, harvest, you know, from this field, from these uh, dead leaves. That's correct. And also for some women, you know, the men would drink away their monies. And it was the first time some of the villagers earned their own monies, you know, uh, not to wait upon the husband who is actually drinking all the little money that they have. And uh, some of them would come a family of seven. Yes, yes. And everyone, you know, who run different corners, you know, amassing this from the sizes of the, the hips. Some were bigger than this. This is one, just one of them that we happened to have in our pond, which we took when we went last time. So it was quite amazing. Yes. And, and, and the local school has also testified that they used to struggle with the payment of school fees. Uh, but now from this village, they actually say this village, something has happened because all the parents within this village have paid their fees. And, and that was actually a very refreshing testimony coming from the school headmaster. So you will notice these are some of the vegetables that you find up in Joseph village, and the people basically coming into work. And we have actually said within the village, no one who wants to work should ever say, I have nothing to do. There is always something to do, something that adds value. And so it has generated significant employment. Now, this crop is part of the crop that was actually, Saru was talking about the winter crop. These two ladies uh, actually came from- uh, This was last week. Yes, it's a good yeah. experience. Yeah. So these two ladies you see there came from where, where is the number uh, one city here? Uh, they, I would call it num num number three. Number, yeah, number three. three. Yeah, the third the largest city in, in Zimbabwe. Yes. And yeah. uh, how many kilometers from Gweru to... Uh, I, would, I would say possibly two, I would say about 300. About 300. From Joseph Village. From Joseph Village to their home where they've come from. So they heard about Joseph Village and they brought all those card boxes that you see. They squashed them and put them in these big uh, bags. And uh, 
uh, they commuted all the way until they actually go to Joseph Village. And uh, this was last week. They came again this week. They just left yesterday. And now when they come, they tell our workers that this field one and two, please don't touch it. We're yeah. back here next week to get some more. These are where they actually harvest 3,000, uh, sorry, three tons, three tons of yes. tomatoes. And they took all of them. In fact, they, 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 they were even saying it's, it's not enough. In fact, some of the villagers who have started producing, they actually realized our production is, <laughs> <laughs> the demand is more than what we are producing. Yeah. That, that is exactly. the long and short. Yeah. And, and these ladies, just to say, the, their friends had gone to other areas in Zimbabwe. So they found them while they were in Joseph Village and say, are there any products that are exciting there? And these two ladies basically said, no, 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 we would rather keep this one a secret for, for ourselves. <laughs> all, all I'm saying is that there is absolutely tremendous opportunity, which we are now finding that the village, even its production at the moment, cannot meet the demand that is out there. And most of them are actually willing at this particular stage to pay for these uh, uh, products in foreign currency, something which is actually of added value, uh, particularly given the challenges that we have in the nation at the moment. But they are willing to pay in foreign currency in US dollars or using rands or what have you. And these are some of the things that will really capacitate the village. So then moving on, this is basically an area of view of one of the areas where the, 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 the cropping is happening. It gives me an opportunity to talk about the future of the village, which is my last section, uh, which, which we wanted to touch on. Then we can, ex we can compare notes after looking at this. So we have been asking ourselves, so what is the future of the village? Well, my brothers and sisters, let me put it this way. We have created a brand for the village. So that brand that you see there at the right hand corner, top corner, is the brand of the village. And we are now saying to fellow villagers, guys, let's put our hands together, produce, and we'll start branding. So if it is cabbages, yes, I know that we can actually put them in a container, but we want people to know that this is a Joseph village cabbage. We want actually a kind of pride to be associated with what we produce. So if it is tomatoes, garlic, onions, or whatever it is, it will have a stem, Joseph Village. So it's beginning to create an identity for the village, which never used to be there. This village used to be known for poverty, uh, always waiting for handouts, but things are now turning and I believe that God has broken the spiritual siege, which was upon this village and beginning to open it up. So when you look at this piece of land here, it actually belongs to one of the villagers. And he learned from the piece of land that we started working with, with Saru. This villager would come constantly and he actually said, I want to copy everything that you are doing. So we are beginning to see replication of the idea that germinated on my um, father's land, which he allocated to us. We are now beginning to see other villagers coming to learn and to take ideas and to take them to their own pieces of land. And this young man basically actually his part, this is actually his crop. And in fact, further on is a beautiful, uh, I didn't take a close picture, but a beautiful garlic crop, which he has also started. And in fact, this week, when he was selling his tomatoes, the customers were telling him, look, you, you need to produce more. And he is actually very, I mean, a few meters from the river, and he's very motivated. And in fact, he's actually made a pledge that is going to produce more um, and more within the coming months. So the vision is catching on and it's setting the village on fire uh, the way we look at it. Again, this is part of the, now, now this is the church. So one way ministries, that's the church house. Uh, we're not seeing the, 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 the actual church is on the other side, but one way ministries is also becoming a center where basic lessons can actually be taught. And so they've got a, a piece of land where they can actually showcase the things that villagers can actually learn. The advantage with the church is that it actually draws people from all, all corners of the village and even other villages. And so it can easily become a center of expertise and skill. And, and this is something which we are very excited about. Now, talking about the village, 
we actually found out there are 12 things that I would call, call basic requirements for the village. So one to six is the basic infrastructure, access roads, water supply, sanitation, drainage, power, and transport. So as we look into the future, these are some of the things that we are praying to God for. God, we need a consistent water supply, good sanitation, drainage system so that it doesn't destroy the land, power, even if it is solar power, because this is the most viable now, so that during the night, young people can actually do their homeworks, can do their education, and we can have power to power basic equipment within the village, but also to provide transport, transporting the goods and the items. Then seven to nine are what we call social and health infrastructure items, early development, educating our kids, medical facility, because right now there is no much medical facility in Joseph Village. So they have to travel about 15 kilometers, 10 to 15 kilometers to go to the nearest facility, to have a trained midwife in the village. And these are things that can actually be put together very easily. And then the village has very clear basic infrastructure to make life comfortable within the village. Then in terms of economic infrastructure, what we are looking at, a shop at least for the basic essentials so that people don't travel long distances. Farm production cooperative. So when we produce onions, we put them together and then we can send them as one batch um, so that we can enjoy economies of scale. And then of course, a training facility so that we can see how we can equip one another on basic skills within the village. So as we look into the future of the village, these are some of the prayer points. And we are asking God to help us to start introducing some of these things so that we can see the village lifting up to higher levels. And then water supply. I mean, this dam, we actually constructed this dam last year. It has got a capacity of about 5 million. I think it's between 5 and 6 million liters of water when full. Uh, it was done quite hurriedly. But we begin, the villagers are beginning to see that it's easy when rain falls to actually capture the water. In fact, there are testimonies around this dam because some of the households that are close to this dam, they actually started doing gardens close to their households and they've been selling vegetables. One lady actually sent a daughter to secondary school. She bought uniforms and, and she was saying, this was a tremendous blessing. So we believe it's actually infrastructure which we should develop within the village and it will help uh, upper capacity and, 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 and empower the villagers to even be more and more independent rather than waiting for handouts. And then I want to finish off on a value addition in the village. Now, this picture is not from Joseph Village. I took it to illustrate that products from the village can then be packaged at a central point and given an appropriate branding and then sent to the market. This is our vision as we go into the future, that we will have products coming to a central place and then we begin to put them together and then we brand them. We are also now beginning to do even beekeeping. So right now we, we actually send some hives and there are bees that are actually now being kept so that we can produce honey. And we want now to come up with, even when we then produce the honey, the honey will be in, packaged in bottles which will carry the Joseph Village brand. So we have Joseph Village honey. So, so that at least we, the village is placed on the market, on, on, on the map. So we, we are looking even at pursuing export opportunities. So what we are looking at, instead of just growing the crop and selling it as a commodity, we are now bringing the Joseph Village brand and say, we want, if it is the tea, for example, that we are like, like, for example, lemongrass or things like that, package it, if it is the herbs, and put the Joseph Village brand. There was a time I went to the US and I went to some of the supermarkets there and I noticed that they had actually uh, products coming from some villages in the African, uh, on the African continent and they put premium value to it. And I actually thought this is an opportunity to showcase some of our products to as far away places as China, Russia and so forth, why not? when we actually can package something and put a brand Joseph Village and send it there. 
and then begin to talk about the advantages uh, that this is pollution free, uh, that it is organic or whatever, uh, and, and then beginning begin to unlock value from the village. So I want to finish off with this uh, scripture in this year, which we call the year of, uh, of blossoming and productivity. Isaiah 40, verse 25 to 31, when God says, have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no mind, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount on wings uh, on, like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I believe that this is the story of Joseph Village. Weak people, people who were considered probably not good for anything. And the land was also considered not good for anything. But we are beginning to see God transforming the land in an amazing way. And I've said that God does not create junk. And certainly Joseph Village is not junk. And we are seeing that awakening of the village. And we thank God for it. Now, this is where we wanted to end, my brothers and sisters, uh, to stop here and then maybe just interact, uh, make comments. Uh, we are not experts, like we say, but we are willing basically just to say, God use us as much as you can uh, to carry the vision of what we have shared as far as it can go. So let me stop here, my brothers, and say over to you. Wow. Thank you very much. We've been, I'm sure the participants are very, very blessed. Of course, we have a few questions for you uh, from the participants and my other panelists maybe will help me ask the questions. But uh, immediately, one thing that people struggle with is that for a village to change, we always think maybe we write a proposal we go to government, we look for funding, uh, go to an NGO, <laughs> tell them what is the problem. Uh, this is our problem. We don't have water, we don't have food, yes. and we don't have peace. So yes. I mean, we are seeing some different pattern, and we'd just like you to comment on that. And somebody is asking, why is it called Joseph Village? <laughs> okay. Let, let me start with the last one, which is why is it called Joseph Village? Um, some in, 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 in 1890, the year 1890, my great-great-grandfather uh, came from South Africa as part of the, they called the Dutch Reformed Church the, of Zimbabwe. So they came to the southern part of Zimbabwe to evangelize. That was my great-grandfather. And his name was Joseph Mbowen. So he evangelized the southern part of Zimbabwe and so forth. And of course, as he was doing his evangelism work, his family was growing bigger and bigger. And he went to the local chief and asked for a piece of land where his family could settle and so forth. There is an interesting way that they did it because most of the villagers used to stay away from the rivers because of the hippopotamus. Because the hippopotamus would go into people's fields and destroy the fields. So the local chief and headmen in their wisdom, they said, oh, these guys are looking for land. Let's give them close to the river so that when the hippos are hungry, they start destroying their crops before they come to our, to our fields. <laughs> so that's how the Joseph village was placed between the mountain and the river. And it was so convenient for the local locals at that time because Boweni, uh, Joseph, uh, the, this Joseph Boweni was a Shangan, which is one of the South African tribes. And so he came and settled in Zimbabwe and created a, a new tribe or a village. <laughs> but the village was conveniently placed where it is today because it was a buffer um, to, to, to prevent animals going to the other side. So, it, 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 so when he departed, and of course the people were getting more and more, the name of the village basically took after the, our grandfather. So it, was, it, was, it has been called Joseph Village from, from that time. So that's the, the rationale behind the name Joseph Village. But coming to the question that you have uh, really asked about, um, if, if I understood it well, my brother, it's like 
normally we hesitate to the village because we say, okay, where do I start? Uh, what protocol do I follow? Um, uh, what should I do? But when we started myself and Sarudai, we were very clear. In fact, she started it because she would take the kids to the village um, and they would stay there for I don't know, two, two, weeks, two weeks, two weeks, yeah. two to three weeks. Yeah. And then when she was observing, she said, no, 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 no. It's not right that we come with uh, containers of food and vegetables to last the three weeks. To last the three weeks. <laughs> and then when we have eaten the food, you are now going back to the city and you are saying bye-bye, bye-bye to the people. <laughs> you can remain with your poverty. She got very disturbed and she said, no, 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 no. So since we are doing some agricultural projects in Arare, she actually said, no, the village can also be productive. And it's, it's not, you don't need vast amounts of water. When you've got the land, is there some water somewhere? So she, that's where she started. Small can I, I could just add on yeah. to that one because initially, I mean, even us, you know, it has blown, yeah. blown our minds. We didn't think it was going to grow the way it has gone. Exactly. Because when we started, it was simply we had drilled a ball you know, for my mother-in-law to have water, which is clean, not coming from the river and all. And each time I went home, uh, people had the freedom to interact with me. And they would say, oh, we hear you're farming in Arare. Uh, and they were uh, looking for job opportunities to come and work for me in Arare. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, the more I went, you know, because during that time, Doug would be at work, it's the uh, peak season. Right. It, it is uh, a workplace and the kids on those two months holiday. So one day I just thought, you know what? Why not show them how to do it? That's right. And when I started, actually we started with about a hundred cabbages. Yeah. On the, on my, you know, before we even went to the plot, you know, which were then allocated, uh, allocated as an inheritance on my mother-in-law's, uh, where she could, because now she's old, she's in the late seventies. Mm. I said, you know what? Can I have this piece of land just to do some gardening and all? Oh, and my mother-in-law was very happy because no one was farming there anymore. So I brought in uh, from Arare 100, uh, because we used to do seedlings from Arare until we trained them how to do it. So we'd bring in seedlings. So I brought in 100 seedlings. And then I thought, let's see how they go. And it was amazing. They did very well. And then it grew to 500. It grew to 1,000. Now, at any given time, they've got 5,000 cabbages. Every month, they transplant some cabbages. So when I started, it was just subsistence farming, really, to try and show them. And I remember I used to run some sessions. We used to do husbands and wives, you yeah. know, where we would actually train them on even, you know, how to bring up children in a godly way. Each time we mm -hmm. went there, we tried to do one or two things. And it was one of those. When you visit your neighbor, have a little garden, even if it means with the bucket you are carrying water with. That's how we grew up. My mother used to say, as we came from the river carrying our buckets of water, after washing plates, you don't just throw it away, you water something mm -hmm. so that there's life. And that's the concept I started sharing with the villagers. I didn't think it was going to grow to what it is now. It can only be God the way he has blown it. And so many times I think we wait until we, we want to look for funding, we want to look for, but you know, start where you are with what you have and you see how faithful God is in multiplying that. Mm. Of course, many of us don't even want, we, we go to the village, but we fear because people want handouts from us. People want something. But what we are seeing here is that uh, because of that, I mean, people have now been put to work. That, that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. To, uh, you have shown them. People I, have been put I to actually work. don't give handouts because they used to come. This one is for that need. Everybody, even the grannies, they actually, about uh, three weeks ago, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the elderly men I went to my brother-in-law who is uh, running the project and said, is there work for any people like us? Because we can't even have money to go to the grinding mill. It's costing uh, 10 rand to go to the grinding mill. And we don't even have money. Our children are in South Africa, locked up there. And uh, so are we going to die because you're only looking for able-bodied people? Then I said to my brother-in-law, anyone who comes to our village, to that project looking for work, they should never be turned away. Give them work that they can do. Mm -hmm. That old man, if whatever, if it's holding the horse pipe, watering for the day, 
If that's what he can do, it's fine. Some the even disabled. the disabled who have got some who are crippled. And they used to say, oh, lucky them who have got all faculties of their bodies working. We have started, actually anybody who goes, I've told my brother-in-law, this is a service to the community. No one should ever be turned back because they are crippled, they are handicapped, or whatever the reason, the young and the Just now, I've actually bought some football, which went in last week, because, uh, you know, there's a school team that was fundraising. They came and they were given work, which was equivalent to the amount that they needed to buy their footballs and whatever they needed. So we just bought the driver right now, as we speak, he's in my nose. He's coming back tomorrow. He has delivered those. So they were no longer waiting for handouts. They know if you've got a genuine problem, a genuine case, they will just give you work. Yes. And you know, you earn your wages at the end of the day. That's right. And, and, and then one of the things that is clear is that handouts are dehumanizing. Yes. Handouts. I mean, they, they, they just remove the, the value of a human, where you are always getting and get. And I, I tell you, you should see the women now when they realize, oh, I can actually go and buy something and actually give it to somebody else. It's so freeing. And it has actually lifted up their spirits. And, 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 and I can see a new wave. In fact, my mother-in-law was telling my, my wife that you don't find idle people anymore, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> in the village. They used to sit under the trees. Some of them say, we are killing time. We are chilling. No one is chilling in the village anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need to comment on uh, the issue of uh, being busy because some people think farming is for the people in the village. Once you come to the city, you have nothing to do uh, with the village. Or uh, maybe some people are thinking you have nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me, let me uh, look, I, 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 I'm a chief executive of uh, one of the biggest companies in the, in the country. And I must thank God for this uh, lovely lady because um, I used to have that mentality as well, my sister, where I say, tell you what, the land belongs to other people. I have nothing to do with that. I was so wrong. In fact, uh, the more I went into the word of God, I realized that God gave us the land because it is a fundamental foundation for what we do. In fact, I love now playing around with the land. In fact, uh, I spend my weekends, I make sure every weekend I go into the field with my children. I, Matthew, our last born now, is, is, I mean, is, we, we, we touch the soil. And there is, I, I, in fact, we remove our shoes because just to get your feet into the mud. I don't know what it is. I, I would do a research. <laughs> but there's something that just connects you to the <laughs> to a life source. <laughs> and, and, and I was telling my colleagues, uh, you can't take me out of the ground anymore. I mean, you can't take me off the ground at, at, at all. It has got a therapeutic kind of um, feel about it. But not only that, also to see things coming out of the ground, the products, and eating the things that you know you've had your hand in is so free. Uh, particularly when you, when you know that there are so many shortcuts now that are being done by so many people out there and they are feeding other people with junk. Um, I believe that uh, it, though I've got a busy schedule, but using the resources that God has given me access to, I can begin to actually equip and capacitate the people who can actually blossom on the land while I also get involved. Right now we have got my young brother who is in the village and um, a lot of them were sitting and saying, no, we've got no employment. He's one of the busiest people actually right now as we speak. When he goes to sleep, I mean, it's like he's exhausted. And I'm sorry, sorry. No, I just wanted to okay. add on and say, you know, when, because of uh, our position in society, when people saw me tilling the land, even here in Glen Forest, yeah. I remember, you know, there's this whole thing about, you know, the elite clubs and whatever. And I remember, you know, uh, at school after dropping off kids, you would rather go and hang out around a coffee club and, uh, or you go for a massage, you go and do this and that and all. 
And, you know, that wasn't me. <laughs> and uh, people would say, oh, Saru, let's go for this. We can drive from one place to the other and go and pick up the children later. Just sightseeing, just, you know, having fun. Actually, but... let me put it this way. Saru's <laughs> way of massaging, yeah? Feet, for example, she would rather walk on stones in the field. And that's the best massage. Making names. Not even his hand can reach. I was telling him not even his hand can reach where God stones can reach. <laughs> so I, you know, I used, I tried, I looked out and I tried it out. Oh, Saru, let's go this, let's visit. Sorry, so. But that wasn't me. And then eventually I just, they realized I was, you know, this land was different. So I actually, and then I realized we had got a piece of land. And I started, you know, going for courses here in Arare on agriculture, horticulture and all. And I tried to invite a few others. Then eventually they left me alone because I was in another category that they could not convince yeah. to do otherwise. And when, the moment I started doing it, then I realized, wow, it was just, it had so many benefits. And I think even when we have gone to the village, people know I'm not doing it because of the money. They know, and they actually have as some goals of now, if you saw us by the church teaching each other how to sew, you end up talking and whatever. And remember, I'm there for two weeks with them and we're interacting and we're meeting every Wednesday, uh, sometimes twice a week or three times in the last week, you know, that I'm there before I come back. And then once they are finished with a, with a particular stage, they communicate with me and organize to go back. So we interact in those meetings and they are asking, but why are you doing this? You know, before they could see the bigger picture, you have got all the money, you can drive yourself and you know, you, you have only one child left now and all those. So all the money is yours. You know, that's the kind of, I think, perception that even to the villagers there, you are driving, you stay in a beautiful home. And all. so why are you touching the dirty soil, you know, so, and all those kind of things. And, you know, the more you relate to them and, all, and the more they see where you are going, for them, it was a shock for, a star, for starters to see me in the field. And working with them, you know, one thing I've learned is not about do as I say, but it's do as I, you have to lead by the example. We have to be there with our sun heads, you know, in our gumboots, and we're all working out. And where it is flogged, we are, I, we are looking at it and analyzing what happened here. What can we do next? Not for them, cell phone farming will not work. People need us who have got the resources to go out to them. And whatever you have, God has got you, you know, it does not add, it multiplies. You will grow that vision in an amazing way. I don't know if that answers you. <laughs> yeah, it does, it does. But uh, maybe, Saru, you can just comment on the patchwork and how far that has gone with the women. Actually, I will have more pictures to share with when we come back from there tomorrow. <laughs> we go, I mean, tomorrow, and we come back on Sunday. The ladies, my mother-in-law was talking to me, yeah. uh, was on Wednesday, yes, yes. and the ladies know I'm coming. And what is actually amazing is I've got, I'll take the loads of pieces of fabric, you know, that, I, the, that, that have been donated by ladies from the Arare Petro Guild. And you know, in Petro, you realize you only a small square like this, you don't need many big pieces is those pieces, they're even using their own torn shirts. When a shirt is torn, it's either the collar or the elbows, but there are still some good patches, yeah, you know, whether yeah. it's a blouse or a child's shirt or whatever, they are cutting out all those. Some of them used to be put by doorways to step on as you get into the house. They are use, utilizing, I actually went with torn clothes from my own family, which we all cut up together. And uh, we started the whole thing of patchwork. So what I was trying to, because each time I went there and I tried to talk to them, they were like, oh, it's for the rich, you know, we can't afford it. So I actually did patchwork from scraps and I finished those quilts and I took them with them to them to show them. And we've worked with from whatever, whether it's a, whatever you can save, you know, from a torn garment and they are doing it. So it's quite amazing. And now we have demystified this whole thing of patchwork. Even me, when I started to think, because I used to see lots of white people doing it. I never saw a black person. Actually, when I joined, I think we were about three blacks, you know, in the <laughs> greater whiter community. And uh, they were surprised that, you know, we wanted to do it. Uh, but, you know, they were so friendly and uh, they were surprised that we would keep up with them. And we going 
And I actually have done award-winning quilts. It would like, you know, spending my time with these That's elderly right. white ladies, they've got so much to give, so many skills to pass on, but the younger generation is there to pick up those skills. So when they were downloaded onto me, I decided why not go with them to the village? And I've told the villagers, when I started, they thought it was daring, because I told them, no one has any excuse not to give somebody a present. That's right. And they said, what? Do you know what the times we are living in? I said, I will demonstrate. And I demonstrated to them. And for sure, they've done quilts. They've sent me pictures of, you know, some have done for each individual in their homes and whatever. Now, when I'm going there, they knew we're supposed to have actually gone with the prayer networking conference delegates, you know, to village. And they had prepared their quilts, they had prepared, and they are still going on. In spite of COVID, they are still going on. And they told me there are so many quilts that they were trying to showcase for the delegates, you know, who were supposed to have gone in August. And we're going to see them when we get there. So I'll take pictures and I'll be able to share them with you. Oh, and sure, just, sure. my mother-in-law was saying, no one is idle anymore. And I've told them how, uh, you know, the enemy comes to steal, to kill and destroy. Right. Using the gadget, the cell phone is a wonderful tool. But so many of them are caught up in this WhatsApp and whatever, morning to evening, they can't even make a proper meal for the family because they're caught up in this whole thing. But you know, it's amazing to see the transformation. Sure, sure. Yeah, there's a question on, um, I mean, what, opposition and challenges that you have faced in the project. I, can you share some of the challenges that you have faced? And maybe just comment on, um, I mean, what I'm thinking about is how, I mean, looking at Joseph Village, you have used what's available. The land is available, the water and the sun. And that's what that's we, okay. in our African villages, every village has something. Thank you very much. Every village has something that they can use to develop themselves. But sometimes we are looking for something from somewhere else. That's not what correct. so that we can take a lead and transform and change our communities but sometimes we are thinking oh no it is too hot here but maybe that sun is an advantage <laughs> i mean in zimbabwe you have winter yeah. we hardly have winter here of course we have a cold season but we can't right. get crop damage like what you right. would get in the temperatures in zimbabwe correct. but you see you have worked around it and also overcome it of course let me not put words into your mouth <laughs> <laughs> no, no, absolutely i, I think I think the biggest obstacle I would say, if I were to put them in priority, the number one is the spiritual obstacle. The spiritual obstacle. I remember when we started, funny things were just happening. Let me tell you, my brother, you know, you know um, first of all, there are people who fear to go into the villages because they fear witchcraft. I thank yeah. God that was not something that was a, a, an item on us. I actually told my wife, we will go and we will declare the name of Jesus. No one will touch me. No one will touch my family. No, I will sleep well in the village. Because we have got friends who tell me, oh, no, 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 I can't go to the village. My children will, do, will be bewitched. <laughs> and, and by the way, some of these are Christians. <laughs> yeah. So I'm saying, guys, we need to take complete authority and dominionship. So I think that is obstacle number one, hesitance to go into the villages for fear of spiritual attacks. And for sure we saw snippets of that ourselves, but we would pray and fast before going to the village. We would go there and basically just declare in the name of Jesus, freedom in the space. And they would say, if there's anything funny in this neighborhood, be gone in the name of Jesus. So I, I would say one has to stand resolute and make that declaration with no apology. That's number one. Number two, there are certain elements that are always suspicious. When they see you coming, they think, oh, okay, no, this guy is up to something. For example, in my place, in my case, they thought I wanted to be a member of parliament for, my, for, for, <laughs> our, for our constituents. So, so you know, he's starting from the village. In fact, during the time of Robert Mugabe, when I, had, I would go into the village and so forth, one of the MPs actually reported me to the president and I was a part of a <laughs> political discussion. And I was told by one of the ministers, I don't know, they, they say that you, you are now sneaking around in the village. Are you part of the opposition or you are part of us? I said, guys, this is my village. I grew up here. I have nothing to do with politics. 
So you do have obstacles that can be related to suspicions around your motives. And again, this is a prayer item. And I think consistently just being clear, no hidden agenda. And I, I would emphasize that point again and again, because I, it's my village. I grew up there. I was born there. And so I, 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 I have an interest in terms of seeing the village rising up. So I would say that, that is the second obstacle that I would say came up. And I must also say that uh, we used to get people coming through almost like refusing us access to certain things. For example, I remember when we started going to the river to pump water into the land, onto the land. They, one guy basically went to report us. Uh, was it the district administrator? Down, they are pumping water out of the river. So I asked a simple question. So you will be happy every year to see water passing through our village going to the sea and not touching our land. Is, is that what you are saying? What is your problem? No, 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 but you, uh, what about A, B, C? So, okay, guys, we need to have, uh, and in fact, we then took the land policy in Zimbabwe and we realized even the amounts of water that we were drawing from the, from the river were way beyond, below even what they start charging it. And when, so, so I think it was petty covetousness coming from other groups of people and that has to also to be handled very well. So that is something that we encountered. And then thirdly, of course, uh, the harsh environment in terms of the weather, the weather can be very unforgiving, particularly when we are now going into October, the temperatures in Mwenez can get up to 40, 42, yeah, 43. Yes, 42. There was a day I was driving in the village and my dashboard on my dashboard, it actually recorded 48, you remember? It was so scourging. And, and the people used to say, no, 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 you will not get anywhere because you put a crop on the ground, it will just burn. And that's when we said, no, but across the river in South Africa, because we are close to the South African border, there are white South African farmers in the same heat, they are harvesting time and time again, sending to supermarkets and even exporting to the UK. So I said, no, 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 no. What is it that they are doing? So we started learning even from the farmers across the border. I would Google and find out, oh, okay, this is how they handle tomatoes, garlic, and so forth. So we took the ideas and started sharing with the villagers. And some of them have actually grasped the concept and they are now on it as well. So I would say it's not, it's not um, an not easy platform <laughs> that you can say, no, no, it's going to be easy. I think there are a lot of spiritual and physical things that one has to overcome. One is just to have an attitude to say, no, God promised me that this ground will yield its strength. God, I'm obedient, I'm ready. Please use me, work with me. And, and we look up to him and he has given us tremendous ideas. Amen. I would say. And I could add on that one, that uh, I think one of the, creating a good rapport with the community Absolutely. is also critical. Very critical. We didn't just start off by farming. I, when we uh, discussed with our children, uh, you know, we've got that wheel of life, you know, yes. that- uh, uh, Social and cultural opportunity. Uh, what is his name again? Paul Jemaya. Uh, Paul Jemaya talks about. And we're looking at every quadrant, you know, uh, social and cultural, how, 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 what are you going to do, you know, to have an impact in society? That's how this whole thing was based, actually. And uh, we decided, so in, in terms of uh, society, where do we want to have an impact? And the children felt they wanted to teach at the primary school where their father went to. And we said, you, it's, we have to be able to do something to some, for somebody who can't pay you back. You know, so many times it's so easy to do things for my friend. And you know, one day when the Mkunzas come, they will bring me uh, wonderful tea and whatever. <laughs> and it's so easy to want to please. But when you do something for somebody who can't pay you back, I think that's the greatest testimony, Absolutely. the greatest ministry that one can ever give. So we actually said, so what will it take next holiday? Sandra was still with us. She was still at school before she went to university. I think we started that about two years yeah. before Sandra went to university. And uh, she graduated from high school in 2010. 2008, 
I think it was 2007 or 8, eh, we started this whole thing. So they said, okay, I will be saving part of my pocket money to buy uh, stationery, to buy this, and also that when I go into the classroom to help the teacher, I bring the resources. And uh, we started looking for, you know, cleared our library of books we're no longer using, and that was our initial donation to the, you know, to the school. So we found that because we had so many years in building a relationship with the community, they realized initially when my children got there and I got there, they were like, you know, what is in it? What are they in here for? And, you know, even the local educational officers, you know, they begin to be quite interested and they're watching every move you are making. And eventually they realized we're simply there to help. Absolutely. We're not there charging, no one was paying me anything. And somebody actually said to me the other time, uh, you know, the more we went, so what is in it for you? Why are you teaching for free? There's nothing for free. Then I said, no, we're just investing back into the community where my husband grew up. And they saw the genuineness of it. By the time we now developed to this, that's why they're now able to say, oh, can I find a job at your farm and whatever? Then I said, no, we're going to start from here. So it was a, you know, a gradual, uh, you know, uh, development, which didn't just happen overnight. So once they know your motives, and now they can even vouch for you because they know you don't have ulterior motives. Absolutely. I will have no interest in politics. We are not there to try and use them for anything. We are genuinely there because we want to see that village developing. And they will pick it up eventually. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Now, sorry, somebody's asking, um, they saw your fields are very clean. There are no weeds. <laughs> <laughs> what is the miracle? The miracle is, you know, each field, you have got one person who is dedicated to a field. And when they come in, it can be a field or two, depending on the crop and the season. You know, when we teach them how to apply pesticides, fungicides, and all these things, the weeds, when they come, the, you know, the white fly loves feeding on the young, uh, you know, upcoming uh, weeds because they're softer than, you know, the grown tomatoes and whatever is there. So weekly, we, we actually do a weekly schedule. Even here in Glen Forest, every Saturday I meet with the workers and I give them the schedule for the, week, for the next week. What are you going to spray for Tuta Absoluta, for example, in tomatoes? What fertilizer are we using this week? For white fly, what are we doing? And uh, the more you do drip irrigation, the more you find that weeds will concentrate you know, along those uh, holes where the water is dripping. And that's one thing. If you mulch, you find some of the, I uh, didn't show you the pictures of mulch the fields. When you mulch, you deal, you deal with the, uh, you, deal, you, you actually you deal, suffocate. you suffocate the weeds and uh, you deal with that problem once and for all. So like right now, unfortunately, I didn't show you the pictures. In this, uh, they've been busy mulching during the cold season because these tomatoes will go all the way to December, January. And so they have, they have mulched already. And before we mulch, we uproot all the weeds. And it will lessen the workers' time because now where they were weeding weekly, we, because on tomatoes, you have to remove suckers. You have to remove all these shoots that are coming. It's a weekly routine. So you are starting from the soil all the way to the top, you know, each crop from the soil all the way to the top. So you can't avoid, you know, you, uh, you can't avoid weeds. You have to start from the weeds. And as you are pruning, fruit pruning, uh, we prune some of the fruits if there are more than seven to maintain the fruit size. So every week somebody goes in, that's why you can't give them more than they can handle. Yeah. So a field belongs. If I come there, I, I'm talking to Esther, for example, concerning this field. Why we were supposed to do this, why didn't you do it and all that? So it's, uh, you need somebody, you, you know, give them, uh, tasks of what they need to do. Even as Joseph Village, as far as it is away from me, every Friday, Elnathan Jack's young brother who is running with the project, he sends me pictures on WhatsApp, field by field. Yeah. He takes close range so I can see, uh, you know, if there's any tutor evidence or any red spider or whatever, or white fly. He takes under the leaves on top. The aim is not to give me a beautiful picture of a crop. I want to see, it has to be informative. 
I want to see from under the leaves, you know, the fruit and all the way he takes life from the soil. So he has so many snippets of the same field that he will send to me. So every Friday, I'm the agronomist now working with them. So every Friday I do get these pictures. Then I tell him, oh, uh, those uh, onions, I can see some evidence of uh, trips. So may you zoom in closer and then uh, he zooms in closer and sends me more pictures. Then we look at them and we, then we begin to say, how do we approach it now that we've realized we've got a pest that is uh, you know, attacking our crop? So it's actually a lot of work because I'm no longer just running with the rare gold here in Arare. I'm also running full time so far away, but thank God for technology. I'm able to, he will zoom into everything from open field. They have put uh, uh, pumpkins now and uh, watermelons. He will zoom in from beneath the leaves on top, anything. If there's anything, I ask for further, uh, for more pictures, and then we pick it up. Weeds are not allowed. So now they've mulched, and then you will not see them. Uh, you're, you're muted. You're muted now. Now I would like to ask, how much is it being replicated in the village? Are there many more villagers uh, doing this? I mean, they have learned, and now they are doing it. Is it spreading uh, into the village? You said there are 44 households. How much is the uptake of this in the village? That's a very interesting question, because initially, they were just observing and looking. And in fact, I remember them saying, I don't go far. But uh, yeah. I looked at, in fact, I remember my mother actually making that everybody saying, no, 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 don't go far. I said, okay, you watch it. God, when, what he has started with us, he will bring it unto completion. So we have been very determined, and I thank God for Saru, because she's constantly watching and she's constantly monitoring. And so we have had the, some villagers close by, like right now we've got one particular one who has actually gone all the way to replicate the solar panels, the storage tanks, and he's actually now fenced off his area. And in the same village, there are some villagers who have been surviving on gold panning. So they've also been quite resistant to that whole thing, saying, no, no, no. We want quick money. This one is too, too laborious and so forth. But you see, all of a sudden, because they are seeing customers coming to the village now, picking up the product and paying very decent money. And the villagers are seeing that we cannot even meet the demand. So last week I had some of them saying, no, 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 no. I have to do something because there is money in this. So I think it takes a testimony out of the center, if I may call it, mm -hmm. which then spreads to the other villages. And I'm so excited because it's happening. Out of the 44 villagers, by the way, 21 of the village households this year have adopted what uh, they call that, that Kumbunza. Kumbunza from foundations for from farming. foundations for farming. So the founder of foundations for farming is joining us tomorrow, God willing, to go to the village, to go and see those 21 households. Then we will challenge the remaining 23 to say, what is your problem? Mm. But the fact that we are almost getting 50% of, of the households adopting this foundations for farming philosophy is very exciting for us. And we believe it's going to be instrumental for food security in Joseph Village. Mm. So to answer your question, it's not an, uh, an overnight thing, but I mm. believe with focus and perseverance. And as the guys are seeing more interest and more customers coming to the villages, they are now also incentivized to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and we are willing, by the way, to actually help as many as possible to get onto that level where they can actually have ownership of their own pieces of land. Thank you. I mean, if it's that's about or more than 50%, then you're above the Pareto principle. <laughs> <laughs> and if that happens, then transformation is happening. And amen, so, amen. Well, amen. We can go on and on, but I think we have really been tremendously blessed and um, so happy that we have learned. And I'm sure our participants here in Kenya and beyond can try to. I mean, we have participants all the way from London. 
Wow. <laughs> we have people from Gambia tonight watching. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so we, we are so excited that this actually can now go across Africa. Amen. And Amen. It can be duplicated. And so I'm sure we have learned a lot, and this can stir up something across the continent for our village. Because Amen. why I wanted us to have this is because we don't. We, Transformation does not just come from Harare into the village. If it no. comes out of the village That's and in from our villages without even big funding That's and right. so much proposal writing that no. we are giving ourselves to yes. something with our hands, with the knowledge that nowadays is available on internet and learning oh, yes. and yes. seeing it, being stirred up, I think that can change this continent. And especially when it comes to food, and, and value addition. Like now, we need all our villages to be food sufficient. If now, Joseph Village is exporting, I mean, within uh, Zimbabwe and maybe now soon That's beyond, great. then that yes. can be great for a village that was maybe a second, like many of our villages, for Amen. second, and, uh, left out. So it's a great, great testimony. And thank you so much, um, Dr. Boweni and uh, Mrs. Boweni. Thank you, thank you very much for coming on and sharing, being vulnerable to listen to us and the prodding with many questions, <laughs> very intrusive ones into your own lives. But we are so grateful that this can go a long way in changing our continent. God bless you. Let me hand Thank over to my God bless you too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You very much. Wow. Um, we really want to thank you, uh, Dr. Boweni and uh, Mrs. Saru for Boweni for uh, giving us uh, your precious time. We know how busy you are. We have interacted with you, uh, not via Zoom. <laughs> yeah, and we look forward to coming to Joseph Village and you said a very powerful statement, which uh, I think all our participants need to take home and think about it. You said lack of productivity. It's a siege from Satan. That's I mean, right. our villages are under siege in Africa. Right. And uh, the Bible says in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 19, for the earnest of creation mm -hmm. eagerly wait right. revealing of the sons and daughters of God. Amen. And we believe this is the time. That's right. God That's right. has already uh, ushered you. Yes. Uh, to the to, to the field to show us the way <laughs> and we are following and that's why we we wanted you to interact with us so that you can challenge us back to the soil there's a king in the bible who loved the soil actually the bible says he loved the soil he, he's called who Uzziah. and yes. i read that scripture and i said i i picked a prayer point for myself and i said God, <laughs> <laughs> help us and our children to begin to love the soil that's correct that's praise correct. the lord Amen. so we want to thank you for that practical very practical presentation uh mm -hmm. and uh, it is applicable everywhere in every village of africa uh Amen. this uh, last week we were in, in a in, in a place in a north part of our nation right. near ethiopia a place called Malsabit. And you just drive miles and miles and there's nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have sun, they have the biggest rivers. Wow. wow. And the soil, you can see this soil can be very productive. That's and uh, we, we are just, um, different things are getting brewed in our spirits concerning that right. region. Right. And we really admire your leadership. Class Ali, so...